Hey everybody, Organized Biology here, and last but not least, how do we differentiate whether somebody's experiencing left-sided heart failure or right-sided, or worse, both sides? That's what we're going through in this video. So first off, I asked you in the last video that you can find here if you haven't already, which side of the heart do you think fails most commonly? Okay, so which one do we diagnose the most? Well, if you answered left-sided heart failure, which I have a star here already, that was a hint, this is most common. Why do you think that is? Well, remember with the heart, we have two different tracks, right? The left side of the heart will pump to the body. The right side of the heart will pump to the lungs. Which one do you think is a shorter distance? Heart to the body or heart to the lungs, which is right next to the heart? If you said heart to the lungs is easier, you would be correct. So that's the thing. The right side is usually pretty good. It's usually fine in efficiency standpoint. So we often don't experience right sided, but if our left sided is weak or compromised, we will notice it a lot because it has to pump from heart to the tip of your head to the tip of your toes. It's gonna be very efficient. So we see this really high demand of energy from the left side. So even if it drops in efficiency just a little bit, it's going to massively affect the body because it's not getting the proper tissues in time when the cells need it. So let's talk about why specifically both sides of the heart could fail. Now, it's pretty obvious, okay? With left side, there's two main reasons. And the first reason is gonna be due to some systolic issue. Now remember systole, systolic means when the heart is actively contracting, okay? So there's some issue with the heart contracting itself. This is usually due to weakened heart muscle, specifically in the ventricles, because the ventricles are the one that are going to be contracting the blood out. Now, how could this happen? Well, we talked in the previous videos that coronary artery disease, heart attacks could all impede the blood supply to the ventricular muscle itself, thus making some of the muscles die off. Or secondly, we could also have... I lost my train of thought. <laughs> We could also have that bad heart remodeling that I mentioned previously, where the heart's under stress over a long period of time due to obesity, due to high salt intake, due to low activity, et cetera, thus reshaping the heart muscle in a very inefficient way, and therefore the heart muscle will be weakened. So this is all classified under systolic because it's the heart contracting, an issue with the heart contracting. When you look at systolic, a lot of the times when you take their echo, you will actually see a decreased ejection fraction. Remember from the previous video, that's how much blood is efficiently getting pumped out of the heart. What percentage of that blood is getting out? So if it's decreased, it's a likely a systolic issue. However, there's also issues that could be because of a diastolic issue. Now remember, diastolic is when the heart is actively resting and filling with blood. So what could compromise the filling of the heart? Well, a couple things. Well, when the blood is coming back from the lungs, it's just not getting there officially. Maybe, perhaps, we could have a very stiff valve. So maybe the valve, that mitral valve on the left side, doesn't like to allow blood into it, so therefore the blood's going to pool up here instead of going down into the ventricles. Well, what would happen there? Well, we would have a decreased amount of blood leaving, but the heart muscle is fine, okay? So in this case, a lot of the times our ejection fraction, the percentage of blood leaving the ventricles is fine, but the actual cardiac output is low because there's just not as much blood there, but the percentage is normal. And again, if you haven't learned about cardiac output yet, I definitely recommend you watch this video right here. It goes into detail about all the mechanisms affecting cardiac output, which is how much blood leaves the heart per minute. Now, symptoms of this. This is probably the most important for you nurses out there. In order to understand the symptoms, you have to understand what's actually happening in the heart muscle itself. So if the blood is not getting sufficiently to the body, the blood will back up and back up and back up until it, fluid will accumulate in the lungs. So on the left side of heart failure, fluid is going to accumulate in this lung tissue, which is called pulmonary edema. This means lung fluid accumulation or swelling. So there's fluid and swelling in the lung tissue itself. So think about what could happen. Think about what could happen. Well, we're going to have a lot of pulmonary symptoms. Those are things like dyspnea, and that means trouble breathing, right? We're also going to have orthopnea, which is specifically the inability to breathe when you are laying down. And you're also going to have a couple other very key symptoms. Number one, will be fatigue on exertion. Now this makes sense because as you exert yourself, you have to breathe more, right? But if there's fluid in your lungs, you're not gonna be able to get the oxygen into your lungs, into your tissues to feed them and make energy. So therefore you are going to be very tired whenever you try to exert yourself. And lastly, crackling of the lungs. So when you're doing your head to toe assessment, listening to those lung sounds, you will likely hear these little minute pops and crackles, okay? That is an indication that there's fluid accumulating in the lungs, therefore left-sided heart failure will be suspected. And real quick, if this has been helpful to you at all, please subscribe to the channel and like. I'll make a lot more healthcare and nursing topics like this so that you can be more successful in your future. So that's all about left-sided heart failure, which is most common. You'll see it a lot in your patients. But how could right-sided heart failure occur? Well, what's interesting is the main reason you could have right-sided heart failure is due to 
prolonged left-sided heart failure. And you say, how, do, how does that work, Mr. J? Well, check this out. Well, if you aren't sufficiently getting blood to the body, right? I told you it's going to accumulate in the lungs. But keep that going for a long period of time. The blood will continue to back up. And it will back up, back up, back up, back up until we actually pool in the right side of the heart, right? So if the right side of the heart continues to pool with fluid, well, now it's going to have to work harder and it's going to be remodeled improperly and it's going to experience right-sided heart failure. It's kind of like a snowball effect, right? Once the sucker gets going and going for too long, it makes an even bigger problem and rolls over into right-sided heart failure. So that's the most key indicator. Otherwise, it's very, very uncommon because remember, the right side only has to pump to the lungs, which is really close by, usually doesn't bother you all that much. Now, with right-sided heart failure, the most common symptom will be systemic edema. Now, this means fluid and swelling in your extremities, right? Usually in your lower legs. That is where it will be most prevalent because gravity is going to be pulling some of that fluid down because the heart's not efficiently bringing it back towards the heart. Now, since you're having this fluid accumulation, you could also say that you will retain fluid a little better whenever you have a right side of heart failure. And because you're retaining fluid, it makes sense that you will gain weight. And I'm talking rapid weight gain. You can gain up to two to three pounds of fluid just in a day when you're starting to have right-sided heart failure. So remember in the previous video, I was talking about diuretics. I'm talking about limiting fluid consumption, right? And the reason for that is because you are going to retain fluid on this and you want to get as much of it out of your body as possible. So that's why you want to monitor their weight and their fluid intake when you're taking care of patients with either side of heart failure. You have fluid accumulation regardless. It just depends on if it's in the lungs for the left-sided or the body for right-sided. And this also goes without saying, but the last obvious symptom will be fatigue. Because if we're not getting oxygenated blood to the body, back to the heart, back to the lungs, and so forth, you are obviously not going to be very well oxygenated, and therefore you are not going to be able to exert yourself without getting tired. So that's a wrap, y'all. I hope congestive heart failure 101 was very beneficial to you. Have a great day.